Thank you. Thank you very much. That is uh, the, that, that is very daunting uh, to to, uh, to come in uh, after this kind, generous introduction. And not to mention, you know, all of you guys here. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for coming and uh, making this this very warm environment. Uh, and so uh, I might have to uh, and thanks a lot to Ftaker and Salah for the invitation, to Catherine, Ashley, and Scarlett for the arrangements and the beautiful poster. And it's really a pleasure to participate in this forum and to share with you some of my current work in progress. Uh, you know, given everything that is happening in Brazil, I feel like I should almost uh, uh, start with a sort of Schillerian excuses for not uh, taking the opportunity that I have here to speak about a loftier theme like uh, global fashion and uh, the Brazilian elections. But uh, what I'm going to talk about here is not totally unrelated to that, and we can even uh, come back to this uh, in the discussion. In fact, when I, when I proposed this topic, I really would not imagine uh, these developments uh, and this situation that we are living, especially this week, and we'll see what happens uh, on Sunday. There is still hope. Um, I am going to talk about uh, in, uh, a project in which I propose to think through and within the convergences, parallels, and overlaps between aesthetics and economic theory. In dialogue with contemporary art, literature, and criticism. More broadly, this is part of an attempt to think economic theory and the contemporary new liberal economy, in particular, from a sort of humanistic perspective, if we can say so. Uh, not when I say humanistic here, uh, I don't mean it as an alternative or in opposition to the sort of internal economic or uh, consideration or sociological uh, analysis, but in sort of like holistic way that humanities could maybe provide in, in an interdisciplinary or indisciplinary sense. We'll see how. At 35 years old, José de Arariboya's career seemed ready to take off. His first solo exhibition was scheduled to open the following month in one of Rio's most prestigious museums. Preparations for a catalog were underway and Arariboya's skill, uh, skillful galleries had devised the perfect plan to convince the French theorist Georges de Dieu-Bergman to write the introduction for the catalog. Each step of the up-and-coming painter's trajectory appeared to be carefully orchestrated. And that is why it was hard not to suspect a well-crafted publicity stunt when, without any order, uh, warning, Arari Boya appeared naked in the vicinity of one of Rio's major favelas and danced his way through the crowd towards Copacabana Beach, followed by a spontaneous carnival-like parade. In less than 24 hours, his impromptu performance was all over the Brazilian media. Did his action embody an internal or an intentional reference to Elio Chisica's engagement of samba and code in the culture of Rio's favelas? Or perhaps it was part of a commercial strategy, soon to be followed by an auction of his recent canvases, speculated one TV commentator leading into a debate on the influence of the market on contemporary art. A playful portrait on today's commercial, commercially savvy and strategically minded contemporary artist, José Jarariboya is the protagonist of Ricardo Lizia's 2016 novel, A Vista Particular, or Private View. Arariboya goes about his own career and life with the strategic focus of a brand representative, as the curator Daniel Palmer puts it in uh, an article called GoPro, the hyper-professionalization of the emerging artists. The plot of Lizia's novel, which interweaves the local and international art scenes 
with the underworld of Rio's drug traffic, corrupt political maneuvers, and the preparations for the 2016 Olympics, hints at the prominent role the image of the artist businessman has come to play in contemporary culture. In the past few decades, as one among many realms into which capitalist rationality has extended its tentacles, contemporary art has emerged as an exemplary and paradigmatic site from which to understand the inner mechanisms of new liberal capital. To mention just a recent example, just a couple of weeks ago, the spectacular, although uh, purportedly half-failed self-destruction of Banksy's girl with balloon, uh, seconds after the canvas had been sold for 1.04 million pounds at a Sotheby's auction, sparked a wave of already somewhat predictable claims regarding art's intricate relationship with capital. One critic in the New York Magazine praised the artist for pranking the insidious auction world, uh, I'm here, disrupting the flow of capital, if only for a minute. Another writer described Banksy's Bank shredded piece as a rebogue of empty consumerism from a master. Contrasting these celebratory views, Huffington, spoke, Huffington Post's Priscilla Frank pointed out that the impromptu performance immediately caused the work to at least double in value and argued that after then, uh, uh, rather than critic critiquing capitalism, Banksy was, ta Banksy was taking part in it, perhaps indeed, as the filmmaker Cave Abbasian put it, this is quoted by uh, the Huffington Post uh, from Twitter, was doing so in the most deceptive manner, that is, while selling itself as anti-capitalist. It's interesting that I think these considerations apply also to uh, Ricardo Lysia's uh, novel uh, itself, uh, in the way that it's uh, portraying these uh, uh, stories as uh, itself uh, selling uh, some kind of anti-capitalist uh, problem. Although the realm of art has been traditionally defined in opposition to this fear of interest and utility, this blurring of boundaries between artistic practice and the market is nothing new. In 1964, Alan Capra declared, quote, if artists were in town in 1946, now they are in business. In 1973, writing about two decades of history of the Sao Paulo Biennial, the Brazilian art critic Mario Pedrosa humorously lamented that once art takes on exchange value, it becomes just like ordinary hand. Unsurprisingly, such debates often lead to pessimistic accounts of the crisis of criticism and of art itself. Like in a roundtable discussion entitled The Present Conditions of Art Criticism, published in 2002 in the October Journal, that Benjamin Buckler uh, criticized judgment, uh, um, uh, talked about the critical, how critical judgment in contemporary art is on the way to being replaced by organizational expertise and access to the cultural industry. As the collector's purchasing power is transformed into evaluative authority, then all you need to have is, Benjamin uh, Bucco uh, says, is the competence of quality judgments and the high-level connoisseurships that serves as investment expertise. <coughs> Ultimately, he argued, this leads to a situation in which the role of criticism itself is entirely excluded from the circulation of art. Just like, he says, you don't have criticism of blue chip stocks. On the one hand, in comparing judgments within the art world to those of the financial markets, Buchlo can be said to reiterate a no trope of cultural criticism. As early as 1929, writing from Paris to New York, the New York-based uh, dealer Alfred uh, Stiglitz, in the eve of the great stock market crash, Marcel Duchamp complained that the feeling about the market here is so disgusting that you never hear any more of a thud for itself. Painters and paintings go up and down like Wall Street stock. 
So it's a very old story in the sense that you know this can be comforting to think that I mean it's not uh, going that quick, uh, but also uh, I don't know how come. On the other hand, if you take seriously the notion of a rapid expansion of economic rationality throughout every sphere of human life, this comparison takes up today a different degree of urgency. In this and many other ways, there are certainly enough reasons uh, to be pessimistic. No, this is very good. Uh, to be pessimistic about the future of criticism. Uh, however, I intend to tackle this problem from a different angle and propose that we look at this blurring from the opposite side. The question I want to pose here regards the extent to which the kind of rationality that informs contemporary new liberalism implies a displacement, a blurring, and perhaps an expansion of the reach of certain paradigms traditionally associated with art and aesthetics into the political and economic realms. More than lamenting the wholesale takeover of the art world by market concerns, I am interested in questioning the nature, structure, and history of the specific mode of economic rationality, which now seems to penetrate every corner of our existence, whether we like it or not. And to that end, I propose to read economic theory alongside or in tandem with literature and contemporary. In recent years, numerous scholars have called attention to the growing presence of economic rationality in every sphere of contemporary life, <coughs> including those aspects of human existence portrayed by classical liberalist thought as inherently removed from the realm of economic interests, such as friendship, romantic relationships. The British sociologist William Davis described this ongoing process in his book, uh, The Limits of New Liberalism, as, I quote, the disenchantment of politics by economics. This is a pretty interesting uh, way to put it. Um, in a similar vein, Wendy Brown has argued that this contemporary new liberal rationality, as she very uh, strongly uh, argues, which is ubiquitous today in statecraft and in the workplace, in jurisprudence, education, and culture, remakes everything and everyone in the image of homo economics. End quote. This colonization of everyday life by homo economicus, it is worth remarking, is not without consequence for the constitution of economic rationality itself insofar as the very essence of economics, as described in the works of thinkers such as Adam Smith and Stuart Mill, relied on its separation from other realms of human existence. Separation is itself was essential to the economic view. So when this order gets blurred, something happens with uh, what's inside. An illustration of this trend can be found in the popular bestseller Free Economics, <laughs> which proposes a sort of new economic theory of all things human, analyzing phenomena from crime and baby naming to sumo wrestling through the neoclassical microeconomic lens of utility maximization. More precisely, its authors suggest using the tools of contemporary economics in order to unveil what they call the hidden side of everything. Ultimately, this should serve for them, I think, uh, we can think as a substitute for the humanities as a whole. Because if everything in human life can be understood from this rather simple lens, uh, why you know, critical thinking? Because the basic behavior logic of incentives can account for all good human behavior and its consequences, not just economic phenomena. And, and here, you know, like uh, I think it's this reminds me of a story that happened. I was talking about the, the fascism in Brazil, and 
people have been discussing this on Facebook all the time, and I remember putting uh, something up there uh, criticizing this uh, fascist candidate's approach to crime, and someone uh, wrote in, in my, as a comment there, like someone with a PhD, uh, that um, a PhD in economics from Cornell. <laughs> but um, that uh, crime, like everything in human life, is just about incentive. If the person uh, doesn't have an incentive not to commit a crime, they will commit crime. Therefore, we have to just be harsh on crime and like kill those who commit crimes, and this is going to solve it. It's all about incentive. How can you not know that? And uh, it's pretty interesting because one thing that does not participate in this logic of incentive is precisely fascism, right? Uh, what is the incentive for being a fascist and for the kind of uh, excessive violence in the sort of battalion sense? Uh, how can you explain that in terms of uh, microeconomics? Uh, indeed, uh, less innovative than it purports itself to be. The biggest achievement of free economics argu arguably consists in translating for a mass audience the Chicago School's long-standing project of, ex of expanding the logic of cost-benefit calculation to every single realm of human existence as epitomized by uh, Gary Becker's theory of human capital that uh, uh, much discussed uh, lately. Among many realms in which economic rationality has extended, extended its reach, contemporary art then emerges as an exemplary and even paradigmatic case. It's true then that what Buchlo has called in that discussion, the quality judgments of the art world have come to resemble more and more the models of expertise used in the financial market. However, what if this characteristic mode of market expertise is actually not all that different from aesthetic judgment itself. And in fact, I'm not even that sure that there is no such thing as aesthetic criticism of blue chip stocks. Um, I'm sure if we, if we uh, read in, uh, deep in the uh, internet, you'll find all that kind of uh, literature. I am certainly not the first to suggest an affinity in the way value is determined in the economic and aesthetic realms. For instance, uh, Regina Gagné's in The Instability of Human Wants, Economics and Aesthetics in Market Society, presents a very insightful analysis of the parallel developments of aesthetics and economic theory from the 18th century to the present, especially in, within the British context, but with reference to, to Kant. Regarding the Kantian understanding of the beautiful in terms of disinterested subjects and autonomous words, Gagné observes, for instance, that it understands aesthetics as a self-regulating, mechanistic, and bourgeois realm, just like Smith's market. In a different but not unrelated vein, Josef Fogel, who has been with that for now a couple of weeks ago, has called attention in the specter of capital to the similarity between contemporary methods of economic valuation and the structure of the Kantian aesthetic judgment, namely insofar as both involve what he calls the conceptually indeterminate norm uh, that could demand universal assent. I'll go back to that. There are certainly important aspects. Uh, these are certainly, I think, very important aspects of the matter. But my suspicion, what I, or my, like, what I would like to speculate on, is that what is at stake here is more intricate than a parallel, and maybe deeper than just a formal affinity. In a short story published 1884, entitled A Pecuniary Anecdote, Brazilian novelist Machado de Assis narrates the tragic fate of a passionate coin collector. Towards the middle of the story, there is a scene without much consequence to the plot, but for that very reason, I think, worthier of attention. After carefully staring for a long time at a 5,000 pays, the currency in Brazil at the time, bill belonging to a friend, was concerned about having been fooled by counterfeits, the protagonist candidly and somewhat unexpectedly remarks, it's always such a pleasure to look at money, even when it's not ours. Upon which the narrator intervenes. This is how he loved money. 
all the way to the point of aesthetic contemplation? What other reason could lead him to stop in front of the exchange bureaus for 5, 10, 15 minutes, licking with his eyes the piles of pounds and francs, so organized and yellow? The collector's aesthetic appreciation of paper money, depicted here as a simultaneous longing for distant lands, brought closer to the reality of 19th century Rio de Janeiro's provincial life by the wonders of international capitalism, muddles the distinction between pecuniary interest and a kind of disinterested pleasure akin to that of the museum goer whose imagination delights at the vision of the treasures of possibly greater and far faraway civilizations. Aesthetic judgments, according to Kant, distinguish themselves from cognitive ones insofar as these are based on perception alone and the former are grounded on feeling, and more precisely on the feeling of pleasure. Yet the pleasure that grounds aesthetic judgment is of a very special kind, as it does not depend upon or imply desire for the object. Aesthetic pleasure, we know, is disinterested precisely insofar as it is removed from the realm of wants or desires, and therefore from the regime of possession. Money, on the other hand, as the universal equivalent, is at the center of this regime of possession and exchanges, and is supposedly removed <coughs> from the sphere of aesthetics. Under such circumstances, what would it mean to love money to the point of aesthetic contemplation? Most immediately, the passage can be read in terms of what Marx describes as the fetishism of the money commodity, according to the 1844 Economic and Philosophical Manuscripts. The specific form of fetishism is characteristic of societies whose monetary system is not yet fully developed, of which 19th century Brazil's peripheral capitalism would be a typical case. According to this idea, the fetishism of money would be a kind of primitive residue, indeed something implied in the very idea of fetish, characteristic of belated societies and bound to be overcome by the gradual development of capitalism and its movement towards increasing abstraction and rationalization. It's not hard to imagine where this reading could take us in terms of locating Machado's work as a sophisticated literary representation of Brazil's related peripheral, or in the best case, alternative modernity. However, and this is another way to describe my working hypothesis, what if the so-called fetish character of the money commodity is not merely a residual element of underdeveloped and peripheral societies bound to be eliminated gradually? What if the aesthetic element of capitalist reason, rather than withering away, remains central and becomes, on the contrary, increasingly more pronounced and determined? Indeed, Machado's coin collector finds curious resonance in a scene in Don DeLillo's Cosmopolis, in which the assassin of the currency speculator, Eric Packer, looks over his dead body and tells us that he wanted his pocket money for its personal qualities, not its value so much. He wanted its intimacy and touch, his touch, the stain of his personal dirt, in a display of what Arne de Bover has called the fetish of the material and the real. Analysis of the novel. This primacy of aesthetics and contemplation as the essence and future of capitalism is what is at stake, for instance, in Jude uh, description of the spectacle as quote unquote capital accumulated to such a degree that it becomes image. An exacerbation of the fetish character of commodities, the image stage of capitalism is the point in which the possession of commodities gives way to their contemplation. In the book's words, the generalizing sliding, generalized sliding of having into a period. In this sense, the development of the capitalist economy does not eliminate fetishism. Instead, it renders fetishism in aesthetics ever more central, thereby 
the blurry boundaries between possession and communication. While it might be true that in recent decades, Homo economicus has left his stand in the marketplace and ventured into each and every realm of social life, it's also the case that the experience has not left his mythical character unchanged. In other words, if new liberalism, as Wendy Brown argues, remakes everything in the image of Homo economicus, this process does not amount to a simple elimination of every other aspect of human psychology in a purification of the utility-maximizing interest-seeking instinct. Instead, it indicates a, a blurring, again, I'm sorry for repeating this expression, uh, of the, the uh, um, orders, let's put it this way, between utility and interest and, and non-interest, between work and play. As originally conceived by Stuart Mill, Homo economicus was explicitly meant not as a definition of the whole of man, as he puts it, but rather concerned with him, this is uh, Stuart Mill saying, and I think the gender here is, is important, solely as a being who desires to possess wealth and who is capable of judging the comparative efficacy of means for obtaining them. So it's just you know, man in this specific sense. What the Austrian economist Ludwig von Mises proposes over a century later as a science of human action is clearly much broader in scope as it purports to address not only the economic side of human endeavors but rather, rather every kind of human action. This radical change in perspective eliminates the notion of the economic sphere as a differentiated realm of praxis, isolated from other spheres of life, which constituted one of the pillars of liberal thought. And while its general tone seems indeed to celebrate the victory of economic men over a more morally or artistically inclined humanity, once those boundaries are blurred, as I blurred them many times already, the transit is open in both directions. And this is where aesthetic comes in, in a few different ways. The disenchantment of politics and of life in general by economics, as to use the expression by Davis, which I quoted earlier, includes and enables today its concomitant re-enchantment. This is not necessarily a good thing by a mode of economic rationality based on image consumption, performance, experience, and what Michel Fehet aptly described as the logic of self-appreciation. It's not unheard of for management and marketing specialists to draw upon insights from art history and visual studies in order to develop new business strategies. Take, for instance, the central importance of image in the contemporary economy. Today, whether one is promoting a company's IPO or a city's potential for attracting high-profile tourism, venturing in the virtual dating world, or looking for an academic job, appearance is key. Individuals, companies, and whole countries thrive or fail on the basis of how promising, skillful, or competitive they appear to be. Everything counts. A suntan can be as decisive as computer skills. Under such circumstances, cultivating one's human capital becomes less a matter of the acquisition of actual skills that will allow one to perform better at a certain job than about constructing and displaying an image. Psychologist Eric Fromm criticized modern society for its materials arguing that modern human beings prefer having to be. It might not be too far-fetched to argue that contemporary society is experiencing yet another shift in which appearing takes precedence over having. And since appearing is not only a means to an end, although it can also be that, but also an end in itself, it is more immediately connected to pleasure and enjoyment than any form of possession. There is this mirror, mirror on the wall kind of pleasure 
which in being narcissistic is also fundamentally aesthetic. Does it fall within the realm of interested or disinterested pleasures? And going back to the questions I posed in the abstract, no. Can this mode of economic rationality no longer centered on possession, but rather on appearance, still be described as utilitarian? In which sense can it even be called economic? I'm not going to answer these questions here, but we can speculate just a little. Um, in that mood, let me briefly return to Fogel's uh, claim concerning the affinity between economic and aesthetic judgments. After dismissing the insisting, uh, insistent attempts of orthodox economists and other free market pundits to transform economic knowledge into a kind of hard science, more or less along the lines of Newtonian physics, Fogel makes the following observation about the character of value judgment in the financial market. I quote him. Expressed in Kantian terms, the form taken by this economic judgment has little in common with cognitive judgments. If anything, it displays an aesthetic character, since judgments of taste stake a claim to general validity by invoking an indeterminate norm that itself conceptually indeterminate could demand universal consent. The quote that I mentioned very briefly. He does not explicitly pursue this train of thought. The sentence is sort of left there as a suggestion. Or the one whose resonance, as I think, can be perceived throughout his monograph on the 2008 market crash. If this wasn't clear enough before, the 2008 financial crisis made it even more blatant that stock prices are much more a function of what can be roughly called the consensus or agreement between multiple market players than a reflection of any companies or any assets objective attributes. To remain within the Kantian terminology, the universal validity of stock valuation can be described as a mode of subjective universality as opposed to an objective one, insofar as it's grounded in an agreement within a community of subjects rather than on a fixed characteristic of the object of judgment. This kind of agreement or equilibrium is in turn supposed to be a result of competition and, uh, well, this kind of agreement is a result of competition and equilibrium within the free market. Fogel's main argument in the specter of capital hinges precisely upon this quasi-religious faith that economists deposit on the market's ability to maintain its equilibrium, a fact whose beauty Fogel remarks, economists do not cease to rave about. This faith is what we call, uh, we call this word that he calls to describe economic theology. Now, regarding this equilibrium, the equilibrium, there is a fundamental tension within the very tradition of New Liberal On the one hand, if we follow the early Hayek's understanding of competition in terms of what he called the discovery process, value and the knowledge of value are inexorably generated in the market and cannot be established beyond and independently of market transactions. As William Davis observes, rightly so, I think, competition in this sense generates knowledge but cannot be an object of knowledge. Talking about the debates among the early new liberal theorists who joined Ludwig von Mises' private seminar in 1930s Vienna, Quinn Slobodian has a great description, I think, of the aesthetic character of the approach to economics. He even compares uh, the debates to the secession uh, uh, architecture and the attempt on uh, building a sort of Gesamtkunstwerk. Uh, they would ask questions such as how can we measure the complicated lattice work of individual economic acts and how can we represent it visually? According to Sobodian, this early Viennese new, li li new liberals distinguished themselves from their opponents in the left 
above all through their shared disbelief in the possibility of visualizing and quantifying economic matters, and therefore necessarily the possibility of planning. Thus, he writes, by placing the economic, uh, by placing the economy beyond the space of representation, and for Hayek, beyond even reason. New, liberal, uh, new liberalism was born in the late 1930s as a project of synthetic social science in which, as surprising as it might sound, the least important disciplinary approach was that of economics itself. In view of their crucial concern with matters of the psyche or of the spirit, this is 1930s Vienna, uh, Gottfried uh, Habele, one of the, the seminar participants, went as far as claiming that economics, as they viewed it, was above all a matter of the spirit and hence one of the humanities, a Geist's vision. A Geist's vision. In a roughly parallel, in a rough uh, parallel, one could argue that while in Marx's framework mystery is cornered in the realm of commodity fetishes, while the economy as a whole was made visible as much as possible. For Mrs. Circle was keen on maintaining the aura of mystery that enveloped the economy in its entirety. A significant transformation, though, in the new liberal take on the relationship between knowledge and competition takes place within the Chicago School around the 1960s, mainly under the influence of Ronald Cole. To put it briefly, this is the story that uh, uh, Davis tells very, very nicely, I think. Uh, Cole's the contribution consisted in arguing for the possibility of using the tools of new classical economics to assess the competitiveness of certain institutional arrangements. In doing so, however, he reintroduced the possibility of uh, objectivism in economic analysis, which Hayek rejected, thus privileging the idea of competitiveness in lieu of competition in elevating the new classical economist to what Davis describes as a quasi-judicial status from where he can evaluate socioeconomic behavior and data in an entirely disinterested manner. This definition, I think, of the economist uh, uh, as a disinterested uh, spectator of society is all the more curious insofar as precisely new liberals sustain the universality of interest without ex exception. So, Everybody is always interested. There is no such thing as disinterested uh, judgment except for uh, economists, which is a pretty uh, uh, exceptional exception. Uh, this is one of the main. Uh, 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 it's a very curious image, the one of the neoclassical economist equipped with his highly sophisticated mathematical tools observing a society like an autonomous work of art. It's also one that strongly resonates with uh, Slobodian's description of the aesthetic concerns of Fermisis and company in 1920s and 1930s Vienna. Not to mention that it was also this kind of beauty that fascinated Foucault in neoliberal thought as transpires in his 1979 lectures on uh, the birth of biopolitics, which is in the world. So I'll bring the shit in. In the second letter of the aesthetic on the aesthetic education of men, uh, Schiller bemoans the state of affairs of his time, for which utility, he says, is the great idol, to which all powers do homage and all subjects are subservient. Schiller's proposed remedy for the situation, as Jacques Concier repeat, has repeatedly emphasized, relied upon an affirmation of artistic autonomy in the prescription of aesthetic education as the basis for both a new world of art 
and a new life for individuals in the community. To some extent, we can still hear the resonance of Schiller's lament in each complaint about the commodification of art and the taking over of the art world by capitalist rationality, and in each attempt to protect artistic autonomy from the detrimental influence of the utilitarian concerns. My suspicion, however, is that today, even more than art and aesthetics, it's utility and utilitarianism that experience a more fundamental crisis. One that is deeply entangled with the crisis of labor in contemporary society, understood as a historically specific, that is fundamentally modern capitalist category, rather than as, as a trans-historical one. And in this regard, it's, I'm following uh, uh, Marxist theorists, like uh, uh, especially Moshe Boston, I think, his, his analysis. Labor is extremely interested in this regard. To put it, uh, put, to put it uh, bluntly, coming back to my affirmation of the humanities uh, in the beginning of the talk, if you think you are maximizing your chances of success in contemporary society by investing in a degree on something useful, say uh, uh, economics or computer science, you can uh, think twice. Uh, there is still time to major in the literature or philosophy. Uh, although probably uh, there are not, I don't see many undergraduates here. Uh, not because the Silicon Valley finally uh, realized uh, the utility of employing people with humanities degrees, but rather because for how long do you think that finding a job will even, even be vaguely related to success in this world. Inverting the Schillerian proposal then, and to conclude very briefly, perhaps aesthetics is important today, not in so far as it is the holy other of the utilitarian ethos of the contemporary economy, but much on the contrary, because it's very close to and deeply entangled with its essence, or if you want, with its hidden side. <laughs> now we can talk about Brazilian tradition. <laughs> yes. Well, okay, so what would be the difference between this? I don't have to say this is a wonderful spectrum. Yeah, there's something about it's making me think of, of you know Benjamin to be a civilization or fascism. You know, I mean that's the way in which fascism itself mobilizes the as an excess. You know, but it would then have to yeah. you align that perhaps with this other movement where the aesthetic takes the you know, starts taking center place where utility starts falling away. Because the labor doesn't have the same role. The AW is complicated yeah. and the learning of the words out there. I'm just wondering if you can see the fashion of that. I think you can, and uh, um, it's, it's very, very closely related. And I think the, probably the link again would be uh, Batai. Uh, that's, that's how I would be tempted to, to making that link. But it's not, um, I don't think I would be able to like, elaborate it conceptually right now, but I am, it's, it's not the same movement, but I think it's very closely connected. And the problem of fascism is, is certainly deeply at stake there. Uh, I'll just take a little bit of, a, a, take some time and I'll try to go back to it. Okay. So, <laughs> and I wonder, so when you say that the capital logic, the neoliberal logic, has expanded to everything, right? Personal relations, language, right? We talk about relationships in terms of investment, as well, as we read all the time, I invested in the relationship or et cetera, right? In some way, there's, this language is also over-determined. So I wonder, like, if you have this kind of universal approach towards thinking that uh, everything is now implicated in neoliberal logic, 
then what is the theoretical purchase of, of, of this totalizing claim? And I wonder in what ways is this logic resisted, right? Like I mean, in the sense of sort of the Foucauldian thinking that you know the power may be created, but so is then resistance. There are new technologies of survival that are always kind of come about. So it would be wrong to, to, to assume that capitalism or neoliberalism is all consuming, all subsuming, right? That there's always something really kind of works against it. Uh, I don't know where to start, but uh, I mean, what are your thoughts? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that, that's uh, that's one of the things is an important uh, aspect. I'm not completely sure either that it's so totalizing. And I think this is one of the arguments that uh, has been put, put forth. And for some of these people, who, these scholars who have been arguing about this expansion, some of them think that it's like all over. Right? And I think if you... Uh, Guys came to the to uh, Wendy Brown's talk here uh, last week or a couple of weeks ago. You know, there's a very bleak uh, uh, outlook on really what's uh, going on and what the, the chances of escaping this uh, are. And but I am uh, what I'm trying to to understand really. And when I say this is very speculative, it's really uh, not just you know as a as a rhetorical tool but I'm really trying to uh, carve some kind of space into these problems. And I think that um, the blurring comes back again and again because I do think that one thing that is happening really is that the distinctions are, are much uh, harder to trace, but which doesn't mean that it's total, right? That there, is, there are no uh, points to, no breaches. Right? I do think that they are, and this is what I'm trying to look for. And because precisely I think that the, the, and this is why I think aesthetics could be one possibility to like carve uh, a, a space within this logic that, you know, in principle seems so uh, uh, overpowering, right? And, but I think there is a certain transformation that we will need to find new avenues into uh, problematizing it. And also, I mean, it's, it's I don't want to say, uh, you know, looking at its positive sides as if we're going to say, oh, maybe we can embrace a new liberal. But um, is it uh, how much uh, worse uh, is it? I think there is a sense of like a catastrophic uh, uh, mood in a lot of these interpretations, which sometimes seems to imply that you know, things were better uh, before. And um, I think maybe we can we can find ways to uh, just turn them around a little bit and. Uh, it's not just you know seeing the positive side, well, really not that, but uh, there might be uh, interesting interesting ways to subvert uh, these uh, very scary uh, developments. I don't know. Maybe I'm just a little bit optimistic because of the last uh, uh, intention voting policy in Brazil yesterday, but it's a very small thing <laughs> that, uh, that the, the, uh, Bolsonaro had fell and his, the, the rejection has raised quite a bit in the last three days. We have three more days to go. We'll see. So thank you very much for that. Um, very fascinating the way that you're bringing together threads, what you thread, how you're spinning them. Um, and bringing them or curating if you want to approach it and addressing it. Um, and so one thing I kept uh, harping on, um, and it, it felt like it was a thread that perhaps was more most uh, alluded to, but not discussed as much as this thing is the state. Yeah. Um, so throughout your talk, I was um, listening to the uh, towards how you were bringing politics. Uh, and, well, and, and thinking about politics, perhaps in the proper box, in the sense of the spectacle of the how this conversation is organized. Uh, but then I was thinking 
about the relationship between the two from the perspective of the state. Also, while you were talking to the and thinking through that, I wanted to um, hear from you how you're thinking about the relationship between this dialectic of economics and politics and you know, perhaps this broader frame of the state. Um, and just by way of more, um, I guess for how this thing about this, when we were talking about that classification between the critic and the artist, I was thinking about how, in some sense, it has been reversed in other moments of time. Thinking about that classic mythology of oppressionism rising in, into power, if you will, um, with you know the um, the discourse of um, you know Bonnet challenging those conservative critics that wanted to you know guard the the, the aesthetic of romanticism, um, and it was the artist that was considered very much as the, the not the more critical uh, challenger of a more kind of uh, rigid conservative sort of frame uh, sort of kind of tradition. And that relationship between sort of republicanism and what we, what we sketch out uh, for us libertarianism. So all these traditions coming into one with a state frame that was challenged, of course, with liberalism uh, and also brought these presenters. So to what extent you're thinking about the state as another uh, bringing it into this conversation. Yeah, that's, that's very important, I think, because the, precisely the, the uh, this is something that comes out very interestingly in the uh, Slobodian's uh, book, and he, in the way he emphasizes that, you know, sometimes people think of the liberalism as, you know, like, we can stay, but not at all for them it was very important to have a strong state or a strong structure that would protect the economy because they didn't think that the like this effect doesn't work right so you need to protect and create that structure and but for them when they were critical of the state it was because even more than the state they thought of these like more global structures that could uh, play this role more uh, adequately. So it's interesting when you say the state as a frame, because it's precisely, if it's a frame. This is what, this is exactly the function of the state, is to be a frame. And so if you think of uh, uh, the state as, uh, you know, in a planned economy, the state is much more than a frame. The state is there, uh, you know, is, is the, the making the art, right? It's, is creating that whole uh, artwork as a, of a society, right? And for them, the idea was, no, this, the, the, the role would be just to protect it. So it's it's really, I think this, the analogy of a frame is, can be taken really uh, further. One thing I kept thinking, uh, and, and Natalie was bringing up Benjamin, I don't have, uh, uh, I wanted to use this, but I don't have yet like a, the, the nice uh, parallel that the, the metaphor, the story that appears in Benjamin's thesis on the philosophy of history of the automaton, right? That the automaton is uh, 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 historical uh, materialism, and then you have the, 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 the little uh, person inside, uh, which is theology, and is actually moving it. I was thinking, you know, what would be the neoliberal correspondent to it, right? Because, uh, in a sense, for them, uh, they want things to look really like they are automatic, but uh, and not like they are uh, uh, that there is someone uh, playing the, the chess, right? As if, I mean, for them, it's the, the, the metaphor would be like a just like a chess board which, in which the pieces like are playing like by themselves and then uh, some, someone is just watching it, right? And uh, as if you put like two computers to play chess against each other, I don't think this is a good parallel, but it, there might be a way to, to, to like shift or, or uh, rethink that metaphor in the neoliberal sense. But yeah, so the state, I think, would, it is a very important uh, side and a very important element in this. The state, or whatever structures there could be, 
that would substitute it in a bigger, uh, in a larger, more encompassed uh, realm. Thank you guys were first, but yeah, and then... Yeah, thanks for the talk. Um, really um, fascinating. I was thinking about like how maybe um, aesthetics as a category could have also shifted since like Kanto's writing about this kind of disinterested observation, and yeah. what is your idea of... Because aesthetics, and, uh, on one hand, was in conversation with like market, for example, the marketization, commodification of art in the 19th century, so it also had this kind of valence of being anti that, and then what's your idea of like science being, because maybe that place where the disinterested observer was, maybe that has been vacated by art and taken over by science, because what you're saying about like economics a lot, uh, sound to me like uh, people talking about science to this kind of uh, disinterested observer, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's certainly so, and I think the, I mean, the, the, one of the points, and this is something that uh, Gagné's uh, uh, book is very interesting, is in showing you know, the, the parallel, uh, the, the contemporaneity, right, of the emergence of aesthetics at that point, and the emergence of economic thought, and you know, someone like uh, Adam Smith, but you, it's interesting you have uh, this, you can say in a kind of schematic way that 19th century or you know, 18th, 19th century, and modernity, like strictly speaking, or high modernity, as a, a time of all these divisions, right? In which people were thinking in terms of these divisions. And sometimes it's aesthetics against uh, utility, sometimes, like Adam Smith, uh, you have the realm of interest and then the realm of uh, sentiment, which is supposed to be separate. And then uh, there are even some commentators who say that Kant got his idea of the disinterested spectator from Adam Smith, right, from the uh, impartial spectator in the theory of moral sentiments, and so how ultimately aesthetics would be uh, uh, modeled upon a Smith's uh, moral theory, right? Although Kant rejected that in his own moral theory. So you have all these different attempts to divide and sometimes science gets a place together with aesthetics because of its disinterestedness. Sometimes it gets opposed to it, right? Because of uh, the possibility of uh, objective knowledge. And then, so in a sense, it's Together, in a sense, it's uh, completely uh, separate. And so there, there would be many possible um, uh, ways to, to talk about these. Uh, so it's like, it's all these divisions and the lines are shifting, right? And I'm sure that, uh, you know, aesthetics, of course, changed since then. And this is one thing that I, I keep, uh, um, I struggle, you know, in trying to come up with this framework, which is, I want to talk about this uh, connection or this affinity, uh, and try to think of this affinity between aesthetics and economics, and in some ways, the Kantian aesthetics, but not just that. So the, the part, the final part in which I focused on Kant, this is basically one aspect of it, but early on when I was talking about image, and uh, about uh, image consumption, or just you know, image, not even consumption, but uh, how image becomes the center of things. Maybe don't even, I don't even think consumption is the best uh, term for that. And this is not necessarily connected to the Kantian uh, problematic at all. So um, I think one can articulate this in, in many different levels, and it would be interesting to develop, and possible to develop it in, in different directions. And yeah, you guys and, and uh, Susan. So. Okay, fine, sorry. Um, so thank you, and I, I come from anthropology, so I'm thinking about practices, um, um, because I, I think there might be a really interesting, con um, you're talking about the convergence of aesthetics and economic theory, and I'm thinking about the, 
uh, if you've if you've thought about how economic practices can be an, can be aesthetic in a way, um, I'm thinking about the language of optimization and efficiency, and I'm thinking about how perfect economic models are. I mean, how ostensibly perfect they are, and so I'm. So I'm wondering how this convergence that you've talked about can be applied and can be used ethnographically to observe and maybe analyze economic practices as simultaneously aesthetic practices. And, and, and I think, so this is all, uh, so I guess my question is, have you, have you thought about, about that? You see, that, that is a, that is a very a great question. It's something I keep thinking actually a lot. Now that, you know, I'm starting uh, this project and by sort of professional deformation, if you want, I tend to think from texts. But I keep thinking, you know, in order to really uh, um, maybe intervene and contribute something more to this debate, it would be very interesting to go to the field, if you want, right, and do a kind of uh, ethnographic approach. And even uh, uh, with, uh, you know, with, with uh, economists, right? Because this is one of the aspects there that I was mentioning. Yes, I think the modeling and so on, and how economists talk about, and how they are excited about this beauty of what they are doing. You know, it, it's really interesting that it's similar to the feeling that I get from talking with mathematician friends. Yeah. I, think, I mean, they're really just excited about, you know, this is really, the word beauty always comes up with uh, my mathematician friends, and I think economists many times, uh, those who are working on models, it's really about you know how can you get the thing that works most flawlessly, yeah. right? And uh, which at the same time sounds so strange in connection to the sort of very interest-based uh, uh, approach that is founding the the place within which these models uh, fit, right? Uh, by theoreticians, by people like uh, Milton Friedman, right, who say, you know, every scholar is just, uh, uh, you know, interested in, uh, you know, he's justifying his own position of being like, of receiving all that money from poker fund and uh, say, you know, every scholar is working like that, is working up to the interest of uh, someone else and, you know, because you've got some money to do that, you do it. And I think economists don't necessarily work like this uh, many times. But then where is the where is the frontier? We're seeing this again in Brazil right now. You have these economists uh, uh, jumping on board with the fascist candidate and saying, no, oh, yeah, we can we can work with him and uh, I can put my my skills and knowledge in the service of fascism, no problem. So it's it's a very interesting relationship that definitely I think F like a nice ethnographic uh, approach would be would be super interesting, and I think there are people uh, doing this. Too.